this morning, we're going to get directly into the Word of God. I have a message that I want to preach to you. Give it up for the worship team. Come on. Give it up for the worship team. And uh, this morning, we're going to get into the Word of God. And, and uh, this is our NFL Sunday, uh, Super Bowl Sunday service. And, and what I do is once a year, I like to preach a certain message to our church to remind us about, one, our legacy, but also our focus. Amen. How many know that we as a church, we exist for a reason, right? We don't just come together as a group of people just to praise God. Yes, we come to give Him glory, but how many know we have a mission and we have a target and we have we have to stay focused if we're going to make an impact, right? So, so this is our never forget the legacy. Someone say legacy. Legacy. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to minister to you uh, on a specific... Uh, topic called the Macedonian call. Someone say Macedonian call. Macedonian call. And we're going to be, re be reading out of Acts chapter 16, verse number 6. And we're going to look at verses number 6 to 11, and we'll get into the Word of God this morning. And if you're wondering, what jersey are you wearing? Amen. Uh, amen. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing my son's jersey from his, his football team, amen, the Paladins football team, amen. See, I got TG Boy there on the back. Come on, somebody. Amen. With my cross, amen. And uh, uh, actually, it's uh, I've mentioned Coach Wayne has an organization called the Paladin Youth Football. So uh, football's right around the corner. If you have a young one that would like to get involved, it's uh, uh, from grades first through seventh grade, right? Coach Wayne, eighth, 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 eighth grade. Raise, raise your hands so everyone knows who you are. And uh, he has a football organization that, that I, I, I help with. So, uh, amen. I'm representing Paladins because if I, if I wore my jersey, <laughs> I might divide the church instead of grow the church. So I said, you know what? I'm going to believe God. <laughs> and we're going to be neutral this morning. Amen. Acts 16, verse number 6, the Bible says, now, when they had gone through Pyria in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought out to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Let's pray one more time. Father, I need you. I'm asking for your grace. I'm asking for your authority. And I pray that you would allow me to minister this message. Would you provoke us, Father, into action? We want to reach the world. We want to reach our city. We want to make an impact. So, God, I pray that you would have your way this morning. In Jesus' name, we all say Amen. Well, this morning, I'm grateful, um, and I want to speak to you about the legacy of our ministry and the purpose of why we exist. Amen. How many know that we exist to bring glory to God, but we exist to preach the gospel of hope to a dying world? Amen. And, uh, and that's what I want to speak to you about this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about the call of God, not only on our ministry, but our call to reach the world. When you look at the scripture we opened up with, here you have the Apostle Paul. He was traveling from city to city and he was proclaiming the word of God. And the Bible tells us that as he was traveling, that the Holy Spirit prevented him from walking into a specific city. And the Bible tells us that, that when, he was, when he rested in Bithynia, he stood there and then in his dream, a man came to him and said, come over to Macedonia and help us. See, Macedonia was a large, powerful city. The man in Paul's dream, he represented the Greek world, a world that, that represented advancement, education, and great wealth. The Grecian people were very large. They were, they, these people were very disciplined. They were religious people. They great great portions of their time to labor and money and to the work of religious works. But there was one big problem. Although they were a strong city, although they looked like they had it all together on the outside, on the inside, the city was corrupted and they were full of idol worship. 
In a place that seemed to have it all together, there were people crying out for help. Isn't it funny that sometimes people can look like they have it all together on the outside, but on the inside they can feel like they're crumbling? Come on. Yes. Times have not changed much, but I'm going to know that people are still crying out for help. See, when we talk about the Macedonian call, what we are in essence talking about is the cry of a dying world. The Macedonian call can be heard when you, when you watch the news and you read of the kidnappings. When you read the newspaper and you see that there's pro a prostitution problem in our city, the Macedonian call can be heard by the sirens at night. Come on. The Macedonian call can be heard and seen when you go to the grocery store and you see somebody outside begging for money. But in essence, what they're truly begging for is for someone to help them. The Macedonian call still cries out. Church, listen to me. Youth suicide prevention stated that suicide is the third leading cause of death for youth between the ages of 10 and 24. Suicide is responsible for approximately 4,600 deaths every single year. According to Crime America, there will be one murder every 22 seconds in our country. Every five minutes, somebody will be raped. Every 49 seconds, robbery will be committed. Victory Outreach Tacoma, listen to me. The Macedonian cry is still heard today. My question to you this morning is, can you hear the cry? Amen. 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 The reason I try to preach this message once a year is because sometimes we can get so caught up in our own lives and in our own routine, we're blinded by the fact that there are people that are within arm's distance length of us that need to know the power of the God that you believe in. Come on, come on. Are you hearing me? And this morning I just felt overwhelmed with the sense of urgency that we gotta get busy. We gotta shift our focus and we need to change it to outward. We're not in reach, we are victory outreach. We are called to go into all the places that where everyone is hurting, that's what we're called to. Amen. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen. When we talk about the Macedonian call, the Macedonian call was a response to the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 and 20 tells us, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey and observe all things I have commanded you. You know, God's master plan for reaching the world was wrapped up in these scriptures. God's plan, listen to this, his plan for reaching the world was discipleship. It was taking everything his father had taught them, teaching it into somebody else, and believing that these 12 disciples would go back in the world and do the same. There was no plan B, so God's plan for world evangelism was discipleship. Someone say discipleship. This wasn't the great suggestion. It is the great commandment to all churches. We are supposed to make disciples. What does it mean to make? Well, to make means to form by putting parts together or combining substances. It's to bring something into existence by shaping or changing of material. And I don't know about you, but when I walked into the church, things weren't all put together. I was a hot mess. Someone say hot mess. Hot mess. When I walked in, my family was falling apart. You know my story. I was on the verge of suicide. But thank God there was a church that was committed to discipleship. Instead of seeing a broken young man, they seen a man full of potential. Come on. Instead of seeing my stubbornness, there was a pastor there on staff that said, well, wait a minute, if I can take that stubbornness and I can teach him to follow God, he's not going to quit. But sometimes, instead of seeing the glass half full, we see it half empty. Listen, church, we got to learn to look at people the way God looks at them. Because me as a man, I've got irritations. Come on. Well, don't look at me like this. I'm going to get irritated. Come on. Right? Right? Who has pet peeves? <laughs> we ain't not talking about pet peeves, but I got pet peeves. And if I'm not careful, I can rob somebody from their blessing because maybe I'm called to help them, but because they irritate me, I'm going to keep them at a distance. 
Listen, we as a church, we don't choose. Like here, here, we, we don't. That's why I say I want to reach the unchurched. Well, who, who's our target, Pastor Eric? Anybody that doesn't go to church, that's who we want to reach. Amen. All walks of life. I really don't care what your background is. My God's hand is not too short to change your situation. Ooh. My God's hand is not too short to change your life from a murderer, from somebody that's the worst of the worst. Listen, if the love of God is not evident within the church today, the church will have a major defect and it will be powerless. Are you hearing me this morning? We're called to make disciples by teaching people the way of life according to the Bible. Mm, come on. We're not here preaching a different message. I'm not preaching to you a different, a different, I'm not preaching my opinion. If I ever have to speak into your life or correct you for something that maybe is an error, it's not because I have a pet peeve, it's because maybe it doesn't align with what God has for you right. and your family. Come on. You gotta know that before I'm a pastor, I'm a disciple. I still get worked with. I still get rebuked. Come on, somebody. Someone say, he's still changing. See, if you belong to this church, this is the point I'm trying to make, Victor Outreach Tacoma. It's important that you understand that one of our main priorities is to make Christ-like disciples. See, I don't want to make general disciples. I want to make Christ-like disciples. The truth is, there are some of you who have said, you may not stay with me one day, and I'm okay with that. God might use you here raise you up and take you to another church or take you to another city so you can be a blessing. But at the end of the day, what we want to do, we want to teach you to keep your eyes on Jesus so that no matter what you go through, you'll never give up. Amen. Are you hearing me? Amen. See, when someone makes a conscious decision of accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior, guidance is necessary. And it's the church's responsibility to care, love, and guide people along their way. We don't just go out there and tell people about Jesus and then leave them on their own. No, we have a responsibility as the church to guide people and make sure that they learn God's ways. See, our goal here at Victory Outreach Tacoma is not to build a great church. That's not why I'm here. I'm not here to build a big church. What we want to do is help you get close to God and in turn we want to build Christ-like disciples. And I believe that if we do exactly what Jesus did, yes, our church will naturally grow because it's the way God intended it to happen. But we will make an impact no matter where we move to. Mm, come on. Are you hearing me? Yeah. We as a church have to keep discipleship as a central focus. The movement of our ministry was birthed, listen to me out of the urgency of the Great Commission. Victory Outreach International exists to evangelize the, dis the disciple and to disciple the hurting people of the world. And I feel like we just need to focus in a little bit more. How many want to see some of your coworkers that are that, 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 that they're not doing too well saved? Amen. Come on. How many have family members that still need to know the Lord? Amen. Are you hearing me? See, we want to build the church that is a true spiritual hospital that when people walk in, they don't feel judged. They feel, man, this is a place that I can get my healing. Amen. Listen, this is a place that I don't feel judgment. I feel loved. I feel accepted. And I feel like I can contribute at some point. Are you hearing me? But it's going to take people understanding the Great Commission. When you look at our mission statement, even as a church, it's central around what Christ came to do. And again, I like preaching this message once a year because I feel like it's necessary to rally the church together early in the year so that we make sure that we keep our focus on reaching souls for God's honor and God's glory. When you look at the mission statement of our ministry, it is broken out in five different parts. And I want to share that with you. And I want to show you biblically where we get our thrust and drive from. Are you with me this morning? First off, when you read our mission statement, it says we are an international, church-orientated Christian ministry. What does that mean when we say international? And there, there it is. And we can send these to you if you'd like. But it's important that you know the, the organization you belong to. We are, and when we speak of being international, what we're, what we're identifying and acknowledging is our responsibility for world evangelism. We're not just a church on the corner. We are a church that believes in discipling people and sending them out to other parts of the world. You may not know this, but last year, this church, we raised over $2,000 and we were able to sow that seed into the church that's being built in Cuba. Wow. Yeah, they, 
we, we have a victory outreach there. And the church, they told them, you can't have a church building, but you could meet in the park. And guess what? They started meeting in the park. And their sh th that church grew from just a few people to over 500 people. So then they said, wait a minute, you guys are causing too much noise in the park. So what did they say? You have to build a building. You will give you this land, but you got to build a building. And you know what we did as Victory Outreach? The whole Victory Outreach, we have over 400 churches worldwide. We came together. We raised funds. Our little church sent 2,000, but there were other churches. And guess what? They're building a great facility that's going to be able to house over 1,000 people. Wow. Because we as a ministry understand that it's not just about the local problems, it's a global problem, and it needs Jesus. Amen. So when we say we're an international ministry, what we're saying is we understand our call to world evangelism. Amen. Yes, I want to reach Tacoma. But then I want to expand and reach other cities within Pierce County. I've got my eye on Spanaway. i got my eye on Parkland. I want to plant another church on the hilltop. We want to plant a church one day in Federal Way. But how many know it's going to take disciple making and a commitment to living out the Great Commission? Well, who's going to go? That's up to some of you that are in the stands. Who you feel God provoking you. God can use your life to make a difference in another city. So one, we are an international church-oriented Christian ministry. Number two, we are called, someone say called, oh. to the task of evangelizing and discipling the hurting people of the world with the message, hope, and plan of who? Jesus Christ. What's your plan, Pastor Eric? When, when I came here, they didn't tell me. They came here, they said, go take over the church. We had just a few people. And I said, Pastor John, what's the plan? He said, Jesus. Come on. I said, no, seriously, how, how am I going to build the church? Help me out. He's a brother. You need to grab a hold of God. You need to shut yourself in a room and you need to ask him for direction because your city is far different than my city. But when you do that, God will minister to you. But you got to have faith and you got to believe that you can help people in their mess. Amen. Are you hearing me? Amen. And plan that is found in Jesus Christ. Listen to me, church. If we don't tell the hurting world about the power that is in our Savior, who will? Romans 10, 13 says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but who can they, how can they call him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them unless they are being sent? We are called to tell people about Jesus. See, what we want to do is we want to build leadership this year. We had a leadership meeting on Tuesday, and we were talking to the church about operating as a team and raising up leaders. But I don't want to raise up leaders from a church. I want to raise up leaders and send them back into the community. I want to raise up leaders and send them back to your jobs. I want to raise up leaders and send them back to the schools. Because if we can raise up leaders, no matter where you go, if Jesus is the center of your life, you are going to shine light. You are going to help people. And the Holy Spirit will guide you on who you're supposed to reach. And as a result, naturally, people are going to ask you, well, where do you go to church? Well, where I go to church is a place called Victory Outreach. And there, we lift up the name of Jesus and we do exactly what I just did for you. We pray for people. We love on people. We believe the best for them. Are you hearing me this morning? Listen, the harvest is plentiful and God is calling us. Did you know that Pierce County is the most unchurched county in all of the West Coast? Think about it. You know how many churches are on the hilltop and they're empty? Why? We're living in a culture where people have forgotten about the commitment or maybe the church is asleep. Are you hearing me this morning? God forbid we fall asleep and we forget that we're called to evangelize and disciple the hurting people of the world. Listen, pain has no boundaries. Pain is not a respecter of person. It doesn't matter if you are the worst of the worst, if you've never broken a plate. Pain, bondage, and the devil will come to steal, kill, and destroy. Are you hearing me? But this is what you have to understand about discipleship. Discipleship, evangelism, I mean, what you have to understand, evangelism is a twofold process. First, we go out and we tell somebody. We don't just pray for somebody and say, say this prayer and now you're saved. No, the second part 
is a follow-up piece that requires commitment, and that's where discipleship comes into play. Are you hearing me this morning? The third part of our mission statement, it says, we're an international church-oriented Christian ministry. Second, we are called to the task of evangelizing and discipling the hurting people of the world. But number three, you know we are committed to planting and developing churches, rehabilitation homes, and training centers in strategic cities of the world. Come on. When we talk about developing churches, what we are talking about, we are talking about going into places of need to plant a base so that we can help people. Amen. Are you hearing me? That's what we exist. You know that Victory Outreach Tacoma exists because a man by the name of Pastor John Heredia heard the call there in Culver City. Yes, my pastor, our regional pastor, he heard the call there in Culver City and he started feeling the need to come to Seattle. He would read the newspapers fresh out of the men's home and then his pastor sent him. He came all the way to, to, uh, to Seattle with his four children by faith and $1,500. They even stayed at a KOA until they found housing, but he came with the burden to want to plant a church where people can come know about the glory of God. Today, we not just have a church in Seattle, we have a church in Tacoma, we have a church in Tri-Cities, we have a church in Portland, we, we're gonna have another church back in Yakima, and one day we're gonna plant a few churches here. But what am I trying to tell you? That the church that you belong to today happened because someone had a burden to go. Are you hearing me? Amen. See, in 1967, Victory Outreach started with one church in East L.A., one small little church. And the vision was to simply reach the outcasts of society, people that were hurting. Pastor Sonny Argonzoni, our founder, simply had a burden to reach the outcasts of society. And that was during the time of the big drug epidemic. There was no place for these people. And as a result, he would preach messages like this. And one day, you know our first church, you know how it started? Pastor Sonny says that he was preaching. And there was this young people that would come. And there was a lot of drug addicts. And there were just people that were broken. And then one day, one little guy, he said he never really talked much. He said, can you come with me? He said, where are we going? I need to show you something. And then he went into a few cities over. And he took them into an apartment complex. And when Pastor Sonny got there, he seen a group of like 15 to 20 people. And he said, what is this? He said, tell them something. He said, what do you mean tell them something? He said, what is this? He said, well, I did exactly what you did. You told me that. God was going to use my life, and I started preaching to people, and these people are here, so what do I do? He said, you're not a pastor of the church. And they planted a second church. Why? Because someone had a burden to help others. Now, where do we get this burden from? Well, Romans 15, verse number 20, in the New Living Translation, listen to the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he says. My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard, rather than where a church has already been started by somebody else. Mm. Come, on. Come on. See, Victory Outreach, we like to go into the places where nobody's gone or where churches have died. I mean, no, churches are closing every single day. Every day, churches are closing. And our goal, we want to plant a church in every inner city to help people. Are you hearing me? Not only are we committed to planning churches, but we're committed to planning rehabilitation homes. Someone say rehab homes. Rehab homes. Right, is this helping you? I'm trying, what I'm trying to do this morning is give you understanding. Because in order, I believe, for you to buy into the vision, you've got to know what you're a part of. Right? Somebody, when I first came to the church, they asked me, why are you so committed to the rehab home? Because when I first took over the home, when I first took over the church, the home was a mess. People were getting high. People were doing, I was working, I was living in Seattle, working, driving down after I got off work, and we didn't really have a director at the time. And I remember there was a time where the, the, the men's rehabilitation home was a mess. And if you're wondering, well, what's the rehab home? Well, the rehab home is a place where, that we open and it's free of charge for anybody that wants help. And I remember one time, I, 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 I either was going to close the home because we didn't have anybody to be, we didn't have anybody to run the home. And I remember that I was going to close the home. I, I called Pastor John. I said, "What do I do?" 
I don't have anybody to run the home. I don't even have the finances to keep it open. And I even called some of my friends down in California. I called Pastor Eddie Caraveo. I said, what do I do? He said, Eric, close it only if the Lord speaks to you. I went into prayer. And I said, God, what do I do? I have this men's rehabilitation facility. It costs over $3,000 to keep running. Nobody's even in the home. What do I do? And I remember I was angry. And then the Lord spoke to me very clearly. Don't close the home. Now, I'm bringing this up one day because one time somebody asked me, why are you so dedicated to that rehabilitation home? I was speaking with somebody about our ministry here in the city, and they were like, well, that's good, buddy. You guys are doing the good work, he told me. He said, but I just got to ask, why are you so committed? Let me tell you why we're committed to planning rehab homes. Because every day, nearly 136 Americans die from drug overdose. In 2015, the American Society of Addiction recorded that there were 52,404 lethal drug overdoses. That is five people an hour. And if you look up the statistic today, it went up from 2015 from 52,000 to now 64,000 people are dying from drug overdose a year. Mm, come on. In 2012, 259 million prescriptions were written for opioids, antidepressant drugs, which is more than enough to give every American adult their own bottle of pills. And I bring that up to say, you know what the leading cause of overdose is? It's not cocaine, it's not heroin, it's antidepressant pills. You ask me why I'm committed to having a men's home here in the city of Tacoma? Have you walked around, have you driven around downtown? I'm going to need time to know we're committed. Amen. We're committed to developing the homes because we believe not in saving drug addicts, but setting them free and envisioning them to do great things for God. Amen. Come on. We're committed to planning churches and rehab homes. And number four, what do we do? Well, Victory Outreach, we inspire and instill within people the desire to fulfill their potential in life with a sense of dignity, belonging, and destiny. We as a church, we inspire people to reach their full potential. You know, this morning I had um, an encounter. I was sitting at my table, and I was preparing my message, and, and, and as I was, I, was, I was sitting there, I had a notification come up. I want you to know that when, you're, when you have to do something serious, sometimes the notifications pop up on your phone. Come on, somebody. And uh, I looked at the notification, and, and, and I started listening to a message by Pastor, I believe it's John Lent, and he started ministering. And, and, and I stopped this. I stopped putting my message together, and I started listening to the message, and right there, the Lord started reminding me of what He has done in my life. And I sat there, and I just started crying. There at the table, and I'm not a crybaby, I'm not a person, but I just started crying. And the reason I started crying is because God started reminding me when I first came to the church, I used to walk around with so much guilt. I walked around with so much shame. When I came to the church, I felt like I was less than everybody else because my family was broken. My parents were chronic alcoholics. I used to look down. I, I, I was a little rough, but I used to look down. And then I would remember something. The Lord was reminding me, we inspire people to reach their full potential in life with a sense of dignity, belonging, and destiny. When I came to the church, Come someone on. took me under their wing. They loved on. on me. They told me there was a purpose for my life. And I remember that. I started to believe, well, well, how can God use my life when I've done some of these things? But I remember they focused on who I could be. Hey, and you know why I cried this morning? Because the Lord reminded me of a very specific scripture. I remember struggling and I remember going to one of the pastors and I said, I, I don't think I can do it. I know you say I can do it. I know I want to help people. It's in my heart, but I have this guilt. I have this shame and I don't think that I can offer anything. And I'll never forget the scripture that God gave me and this is what broke me this morning. It was a reminder from the Lord and I believe it's for some of you that maybe battle with self-worth. Listen to what the Bible says. Leviticus 26, 13. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of yoke and enabled you to walk with your heads held high. Come on. See, this morning as I was sitting at my kitchen table, the Lord was reminding me of when I used to walk with my head down. I was afraid to talk to certain people, but I remember when the pastor taught me that scripture. There were 
was something that happened inside of me. And I said, wait a minute, I am a child of God. Wait a minute, sin, sin knows no boundaries. Jesus died for me like he did somebody else. And I started to believe. <clears throat> See, there are people in this world that they have no dignity. Maybe the world has taken it from them. And it's our responsibility as a ministry to inspire them to reach their full potential and help them find a place of dignity, belonging, and destiny. Amen. Are you hearing me this morning? Come on. We got to let people know that their life matters and counts for something. We are committed to inspiring people. This is why I meet with people so often. This is why I'm constantly... Developing relationships because I need people to know that they matter. Come on. Our church is really focusing on building relationships and going deeper this year because we don't want to build a shallow church. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen. How many could agree that you're like, man, I could go deeper in my relationships? Amen. Amen. Right? But we got to take the masks off and we got to surrender to the work of the Lord. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen. See, the key to the Macedonian call is that someone heard the cry. The power behind that story of the Apostle Paul having a dream of a man saying, come to Macedonia, was not the man himself, but it was Paul's willingness to stop his agenda. Because remember, the Bible says he was trying to go into a different city, but the Spirit quickened him and said, no, don't go into that city, and showed him the city of Macedonia. What am I trying to say? In order for us to fulfill the Great Commission, God's people needs to be spiritually sensitive to responding to God so that we can make an impact. Are you hearing me this morning? Acts 16, 10 and 11 says this. Now after he had seen the vision immediately, the Bible doesn't say that he thought about it and then went. No, he, he seen this vision of a man from Macedonia that looked perfect, but he was asking for help. The Bible says immediately they sought out and went to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called them to preach the gospel to them. Church, it's time. It's time for us to break routine and to do the work of the Lord wholeheartedly. Come on. And I say that because sometimes I admit my schedule gets booked up with a certain agenda, but I'm realizing that in my agenda, my agenda is chaotic. Come on, somebody. How many would admit that sometimes your life is chaos? Come on. Right? Maybe, just maybe, if we pause, because some of us only know what we know. This is how we've always done it in our family. This is how, how I've always thought. But when we pause and we align our thoughts to the Bible and we implement what the Bible says, we experience true blessing. See, church, it's time for you to use your gift to not only bless the church, but meet the needs of those around you. Yes. God has called you. And this is what I feel he's telling our church. Isaiah 40, verse number 3 Listen, I hear the voice of someone shouting, make a highway for the Lord through the wilderness. Make straight, smooth roads through the deserts for our God. Fill the valley and level the hills. Straighten out the curves and smooth off the rough spots. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. What the Lord was showing me and what I believe for our church is that in other words, the picture that you see is of people making a highway in the hills. Now think about that for a second. And you, Brother Eric, you can come on up. In order to make a roadway in the hills, it takes hard work. Victory Outreach, if we're going to make an impact, we're going to have to work hard this year. And we're going to have to believe God to reach more families. I don't know about you, but I don't know where I would be if the church wasn't available to me when I walked in. But we have a mission. And we gotta reach the people in our neighborhoods. Are you hearing me this morning? 
It's our responsibility as you stand with me this morning.